Well, good afternoon and welcome to this, the latest in the Royal United Service Institute's adversarial study seminar series, where we seek to examine how militaries around the world will adapt to the changing character of war in the 21st century. I'm Siddharth Korshul, a fellow here at the military sciences team at RUSI, and today it's my great pleasure to be chairing Dr. Quentin Van Ziel, who will be speaking to us about the psychology of convincing an opponent that they're beaten. When one uh, talks to members of military circles and sort of related uh, areas of academia, uh, two themes are consistent uh, in contemporary discourse. Uh, the idea of persistent competition in which decisive battles in the vein of a Kursk or an Austerlitz will be few and far between and the idea that the cognitive dimension of warfare will be increasingly critical. Yet the links between the two, whilst tacitly understood, are very rarely spelled out. Surely, if we cannot annihilate the opponent, we need to convince them that they're beaten. And yet we perhaps have more ground to cover with regards to understanding what the preconditions for psychological defeat are, how they can be achieved, and how we can borrow from fields beyond the traditional sort of areas of military science, like psychology and neuroscience, to inform our understanding of these matters. Our speaker today is very well positioned to take on this interdisciplinary question. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Quentin, uh, his research at King's College London uh, focused on the behavioral dimensions of conflict outcomes and belligerent parties' risk attitudes and the ways in which fields uh, such as behavioral psychology, neuroscience, and zoology can be blended with uh, traditional historical an analysis and strategic studies to inform our understanding of these topics. He also has had a practitioner's view of the battlefield, having served in, a, in numerous South African conflicts as a mechanized infantry officer. Uh, Quentin, thanks very much for being with us. I look forward to what I'm sure will be a very engaging lecture. Uh, before I turn over to our speaker for the day, just a couple of administrative things from my end. Firstly, we are on Chatham House rules. So what our speaker says during the lecture is on the record, but the Q&A session is off the record. Uh, the second thing I'd, do, I'd like to do is point your attention to the Q&A button in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, please feel free to make a liberal use of it, including uh, during the lecture. I'd be happy to collate your questions for the Q&A sec uh, section of this discussion once we reach that point. So with that having been said, Quentin, over to you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Sid. Um, and thank you too for the, um, for the invitation to contribute to the adversarial studies program. Um, I think we all anticipate that um, in the decade or so ahead of us, uh, we are going to be facing some unique challenges and uh, that as a consequence, we are going to need to uh, fight even smarter than what we are uh, uh, currently accustomed to. And that as part of that, uh, of that effort, we need to, uh, we need to uh, think about the adversary. So as, as an informal proposition, uh, the more money we have, the less inclined we are to think of the adversary. Uh, certainly within the next decade or so we are going to need to change that mindset and approach and i am of the opinion that the adversarial studies program is going to be invaluable in that regard now i do have a, a powerpoint presentation and if i pop that up uh, can everybody see that <coughs> Just a thumbs up if uh, okay. Um, so the uh, topic of the day um, is forceful persuasion: the psychology of convincing an opponent that they are beaten or they are beaten. Before we dive into that, uh, a couple of things that we are not going to talk about. In the first place, there are not going to be any Jedi mind tricks here. So um, if you are expecting a, a silver bullet or a white knight that will magically enable you to uh, defeat an opponent, um, sorry, we are not there yet. I don't think we will ever be. The, uh, the, second, uh, the second aspect that I uh, quickly want to touch on 
is we are going to discuss biology at some point uh, alongside with psychology. I, um, I hope that it doesn't turn into an episode of House MD, but uh, you know, if, there, if there's anything that uh, you want us to, uh, uh, to touch on again, uh, because we are going to have to move very quickly, just uh, raise a question, a, a question about that during the Q&A session. And then finally, um, before we jump off, is that the content of this talk is not a zero sum proposition. So in terms of what your understanding already may be of the dynamics of, of conflict, of warfare, of conflict outcomes, Please view this what, uh, what you are uh, going to receive here as ancillary to that. It's not meant to replace anything. Um, but as I said, we do have a lot of ground to cover, so uh, let's get on with it. And the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is the background that we have for this slide. It's called the Ludovisi Gaul. It is a statue group that uh, it's, a, it's a Roman copy of a Hellenistic original. And it depicts a, 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 a Gaulish warrior uh, about to plunge a sword into his chest. The reason why I'm drawing your attention to that is to illustrate how important this topic is. It's uh, until this, uh, the end of the Second World War, it was not uncommon for the vanquished to, to take their own lives, to commit suicide. Um, in fact, the, the, I uh, compiled a, a, a list of uh, German officers who decided to, um, to follow Hitler into, into the afterlife uh, in the bunker in those final moments as the Red Army closed around Berlin and the, uh, and the, uh, and the Führer bunker. And then at the same time commented, or directly after that commented, that it would probably be less onerous to compile a list of the survivors in Tokyo following the, uh, the Japanese defeat, uh, the, the Japanese surrender. Um, so this is important stuff. And um, I, th I think that um, hopefully we're going to gain some understanding of what the dynamics behind behind that is. But the uh, first way we have to start is with Karl von Clausewitz, uh, specifically on agency. This handsome fellow was a 19th century Prussian general as well as philosopher, uh, specifically a contemporary of the likes of Scharnost, Gneisenau, uh, uh, Blücher. We can think of them as the second generation of, of Prussian military thinkers. Um, and certainly instrumental in the formation of Prussian military thought as the, uh, as the guiding, uh, uh, the guiding light, if you will, in terms of military thinking and, and constructions uh, on the continent during the 19th and uh, uh, early 20th century. And of course, what we have here is his definition of, um, of war, which he offers very early in his book, and that's the use of force to compel our enemy to do our will. Now, this is critical because according to Clausewitz, um, this compulsion that he speaks of is to leave the enemy no choice. He must be stripped of agency. And this is of course a highly kinetic process. It has to do with that use of force. And really what we then do is we kill all these soldiers, we bomb all these cities and we park a battleship in his harbor to accept his surrender. Now, of course, since the Second World War, there has been a number of very influ influential contributors to our space. Uh, this gentleman that you see here is Thomas Schelling. Uh, he was a, a Nobel, Nobel laureate uh, in economics, uh, but made a massive contribution in terms of working through the strategy, the strategy and the strategy theory behind nuclear, um, an era of nuclear plenty. And 
of course, uh, he, along with the other thinkers such as Bernard Brody, uh, the Volsetter, uh, Volsetters, um, Herman Kahn, started thinking about the feasibility of, uh, of compulsion. Because if your enemy has the capacity to do you great harm, even in his dying moments, then maybe that's not a position we want to manipulate him into. And of course, um, uh, Thomas Schelling came up with it, or not, he didn't come up with the term, but a term that he used for that is suasion, which is uh, either persuasion or dissuasion. It's a term that I'm not particularly fond of. Uh, and I thought it was just something of the time, but apparently it was first used by Chaucer in 1373. So it's, uh, it's certainly... Uh, uh, maybe not a term that's used very often today, but it is uh, certainly one that has a legitimate place in the English lexicon. But as it is, so with, um, with persuasion or suasion, if we will, is uh, we retain choice. We leave the agency of the opponent intact. Um, and uh, we make things a little bit easier for ourselves because we can now um, dig wells and build schools and hope to convince the opponent that, uh, that he should bend to our will. Of course, that still remains to be seen. Um, because if we think about the, uh, the process of persuading a person who is utterly convinced of a particular worldview. And I think we see so many examples of that today, and I'm not going to name any specifics, but I'm sure that you won't be short of any, any examples. Um, the, more that, the more that we attempt to persuade somebody else specifically in the form of a, a logic attack, if you will. So if we say something like, yes, so, so many million. Or, you know, that person who we are attempting to reason with and attempting to persuade feel that they have to defend their position. And of course, when you defend the position, you become entrenched. Um, so the more we shout at one another, the more entrenched we become, and therefore the less likely it is that a commonplace persuasion will, um, will be possible at all. Now, to, to illustrate this for you, what I'd like to do is I'm going to stop this uh, share here and uh, start a new share. And this is where I'm going to... Um, attempt my drawing skills, so if you will bear with me for a second. And we're going to draw a simple graph, and what I'm hoping to do with this graph is I want to illustrate to you what happens in the mind of your adversary at the moment of defeat. And here on the x-axis, we give time as it should be. And over here, although we mark that D, what we mean by that is um, it is the propensity that uh, the opponent has to auto-diagnose abstract defeat. Now that sounds like a lot. What it means is how likely is it that this guy is going to realize that uh, it's in his best interest to uh, rethink his position and rather quickly. And, if you bear with me a second, let's complete this. And what I want to give you here is a line that I'm calling, that I call the rest line, the line of rest that is where his natural state is. And I want to supplement that with a, a this broken line. And we call that his threshold. And hopefully it will all become apparent in a moment. And what we're now going to do is 
this guy is at the state of rest and we give him some bad news and we give him some bad news, bad news, bad news. And then the opponent needs to encounter a line of cognition or an event of, of, of awareness. And at that point, we expect him to spike, spike, and come back to rest. <clears throat> now, we are going to focus on this here. We are going to focus on this here. And we are going to focus on this here. So these three areas are what we are in essence going to talk about. And this first area, this one here, is an area that we refer to as marinating. Now, I think let's uh, go back to our presentation. And what you should have on your screen right now is a definition of abstract defeat. Now, I'll, that will hopefully clear all of these cryptic uh, terms that um, that I have provided you with in the in the uh, previous present uh, in the previous part of the presentation. And here we go. It is the unpleasant, transient psychological state that a combatant enters into upon the development of the perception that a significant discrepancy exists between his desired future and an emergency reality, along with the perception of a diminished capacity for the correction thereof, on condition that he is the first participant to do so. Right, so the key aspects that we, that we want to um, bring to bear here on uh, on this awareness or this pre-awareness line, if you recall, then uh, let me just get back to that. So this this area that uh, we refer to here is that the opponent may find himself in a position where for all intents and purposes he had been defeated he just doesn't know it yet we need to find a way of telling him and the first of uh, the this first area or marinating is exactly uh, or relates to that so back to the presentation and what we have here uh, there are two aspects that I want to share with you here. And the first one is uh, the, uh, the, the experimentation performed by two gentlemen um, shortly, uh, let's say it's uh, shortly after the war. And uh, these two gentlemen, uh, Frank Bronson and Basil Eleftherio, determined that um, defeat is something that can be taught. In other words, that with repetition, it is, it is possible to teach, in their case, uh, a laboratory mouse to accept defeat. And as we can see here on the graph that you have in front of you, and please ignore the title of this, I'll, I'll give a little bit more information on that. Um, but over a period of eight contacts that the uh, levels of uh, the levels of stress hormones in a mouse and for that matter in humans as well uh, increase measurably now what makes this interesting is that these uh, stress hormones 
have got uh, all have half lives. I'm showing one here, uh, so called adrenocortico uh, hormone levels, uh, but there are others as well. And they have, uh, and all these hormones have half lives. So if you can imagine, uh, let's take as a thought experiment, uh, there is a, a, a milliliter of ACTH in, uh, uh, in our bloodstream. And within 10 minutes, that halves. So it's the half life. And if that continues and there is no addition of ACTH, then the person will naturally, or, or the hormone will naturally uh, disappear out of, or, or, or be cleaved out of the bloodstream. So <laughs> for a mouse, to show such a retention as what we have on the graph here of ACTH is nothing short of spectacular. And of course, the reason for that is that the, the parts of the body which contributes to this whole, uh, the, the stress axis, the, you know, the combat stress axis, uh, increases in weight over the duration of, of uh, consecutive battles. So in this particular case, uh, what uh, Frank Bronson and, and Basil Lefthero did was uh, they weighed the adrenal glands of, of these mice at various intervals, as you can see there over eight days. And uh, what this indicates is that the adrenal glands underwent a physical change. They grew. Now, uh, we express that growth in weight, but in essence, what we're looking at here is these defeated mice became more effective at uh, producing stress hormones. The third, uh, the third graph that I want to show you on Bronson and Eleftheria's uh, research is uh, this one, which is a measurement of how long these fighting mice would fight per day. And as we can see that from day one, we have uh, around about 30 seconds. Now, in fairness, they didn't really fight. What would happen is one mouse would chase another mouse uh, for 30 seconds, day one but then a sharp decrease to day four. So by day four, we hit a plateau. And for all intents and purposes, and this along with the previous two graphs, we can, uh, we can infer or we can uh, forward the proposition that the defeated mouse has learned defeat. He's, he's, now, uh, he's now predisposed to accept defeat. At this point in time, this mouse no longer offers resistance, even if he encounters any arbitrary mouse that doesn't matter, he, auto he automatically submits. Right. <laughs> so going back to the uh, whiteboard that we had here, and we see uh, if I just get my spotlight on again, this is what this area here attempts to achieve. So we are marinating him. We are get, making him used to the concept that whenever he encounters us, so We are, we, are, we are introducing him to the physiological aspects of, of his relationship with us. Every time that he encounters us, he, he gets hurt. Right, so um, as the second aspect of this, uh, of this marina uh, marinating, what I want to do is go back to the PowerPoint. And this is something that is called the Scharnhorst conjecture, or I call it the Scharnhorst conjecture. And really what this is all about is how do we introduce uh, 
bad news to the enemy. And what I have here is a rather primitive representation of a, uh, a, a squadron of tanks. So uh, four troops of four tanks each. And we say that there are obviously a number of ways. If this is the enemy squadron, uh, let's knock out that tank. Let's knock out that tank. Let's knock out that tank. And maybe that one. All right. Now, you would agree with me that if we had to look at an alternative for presenting that is what I've just shown you is the equivalent of that. But I think that you will also recognize that this um, approach that I've just shown you is, is more likely to get the attention of, of, the, uh, of the opponent and it's more likely that this will give him an awareness that he has a problem. He has, in fact, in this example, lost a, uh, a quarter of his, his force. Whereas with the previous method that I've shown you, let's just uh, uh, return to that, something like that. With this, it is not in his face, which means that it can slip under the radar. Now, in many respects, whether you want it to slip under the radar or not is entirely uh, a command choice, I would imagine. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is certainly, if we return to our previous share, uh, let me just see. I seem to have. If we, if we return to this here, uh, we see that this uh, gradual impression on him uh, will lead him to a, uh, to a very specific point, and that is that uh, he will find himself above this threshold, which is very critical, and I'll explain in a second, at the time when he gains his cognition. When this is the case, then, and if your opponent is a human, he will experience, uh, he will actualize uh, abstract defeat at this point in time. All right, so um, at that point where, uh, and, and this is critical, if if he, if he doesn't encounter this line of cognition, cognition, obviously it won't happen. Also, if he had to encounter the line of cognition before he exceeds this threshold, nothing is going to happen. When both of those occur at the same time, your man's toast. What happens beyond here, uh, and this is also something that we see in recent events. Once again, I'm not going to name any specifics, but your opponent will uh, find himself in a position where he wants to, uh, or where he will oscillate. Now there's a distinction here between oscillation and vacillation. Obviously, uh, obviously vacillation is, do I want the steak or do I want the lobster? This is oscillation, which means that he, he periodically uh, loses and regains, even if only temporarily, his agency. And we see this in particular where, um, and this is accompanied then usually by a, a great deal of emotionality, you know, of, of rage, um, of, of sadness, uh, and uh, the opponent goes through various phases where uh, here, at the, uh, here at the bottom, uh, in an area that we call the overreach, uh, nothing is a problem, um, let's carry on with the fight, if anything. Uh, but here at the top, that his world has come to an end. The, the, the bottom had literally dropped out of his, uh, out of his worldview. Um, so this is... Uh, this is the, uh, I think we can return here for a second to our PowerPoint presentation. And we are now uh, 
back for the final slide at the definition of abstract defeat. And the question is um, whether any of this that I have discussed can be engineered. Um, I th think that uh, the short answer is yes, I believe it can. Uh, it's not, it's certainly not easy, it's not trivial. But if we look at the, uh, at, at, for instance, Napoleon Bonaparte's conduct uh, at, at Austerlitz and, uh, and Jena Auerstedt, uh, those particular battles, we can, we see a specific command. Now, of course, um, if, uh, if there is one candidate for military genius uh, in the 19th century, it's certainly not uh, Clausewitz, it would be Napoleon. And we have to ask ourselves if we don't set the bar too high. Um, I think that it's, it's certainly not going to be everybody and any, anybody's, uh, or within everybody and anybody's ability. But uh, once again, I don't think that, um, I, I don't think that it is completely outside of the realm of the possible. And also I, uh, I think that having these type of conversations and discussions around the psychology and you know the biology of that is, is certainly helps us to uh, to get to that point where we are more comfortable in understanding what it takes, even if we still may have trouble engineering it. I think um, what I'm going to do is uh, leave it there, and uh, perhaps hand over to Sid. How are, how are we doing for time, Sid? Oh, excellent. And let me first say thank you for that really fascinating lecture. I think we've really covered a lot of ground there. And, you know, it was absolutely fascinating stuff. So 